Okie dokie, so we should be live now. What I'll do, lesson I learned from last time is just to give it a few seconds at the beginning so that anyone can tell me at home if there's an audio problem. So, guys, if it, can you hear me okay? I've actually got my wife in the other room. So, Rach, can you just confirm if it's okay? Yeah, she says it's all good. And so, yeah, let's make a start. So, first of all, welcome to everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm here with the director of award-winning documentaries on the subject of 5MEO DMT and Booth Alvarius. Um, which called the uh, first one was called the underground secret and the second one was before various reloaded um so the, di the director is uh, philip zaruba so philip how are you doing uh, first of all thank you for inviting me and i'm doing fine in these crazy times indeed. <laughs> it, it definitely is crazy times I, I don't know where you are mate but we're kind of like buried under about yeah like like two feet of snow at the moment it's uh it's it's just inc insane but whereabouts are you, are you based at? I think even somewhere in I'm, Europe. I'm based in Central Europe in the Czech Republic in a city called Ostrava. It's in the northeast of Czech Republic. And how are things going there at the moment? Are you sort of like very sort of in, in, you know afflicted with all the corona stuff or are you managing to get by relatively unscathed? No, uh, the Czech government is completely crazy and the situation is... is it's very, very bad here. But right. we, are, we are doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few uh, topics I want to talk around. I suppose a good place to start is, um, is just introduce yourself. Like, who is Philip Zaruba? Oh, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a multimedia artist. I do, I do music. I do graphic design. I do 3D animation. Basically anything that is connected to music or graphics. Uh, I studied a film school where I studied 3D animation, so my regular job is to do um, 3D visualization, product design and graphics and all that stuff. Besides that, I produce music, mainly drum and bass, and uh, I also run an association which is called Asaya, mm -hmm. and this is, this, is, this is what we run with my friends. And we organize events, conferences, we produce books, uh, movies, and we organize workshops. And we are uh, basically what we do, what we are interested in is shamanism, transpersonal psychology, uh, science, uh, non duality, yoga, mysticism, and all that stuff. Yeah, so I mean, it's quite a quite a diverse set of sort of topics there. Uh, I didn't realize you kind of, you, you dabbled in so many different areas. And, but as I mentioned, you know, the, the reason I think we kind of cross paths, well, actually the reason we cross paths is because we have a mutual friend um, and that we actually very briefly met in person uh, about three years ago, I think it was now, wasn't it? Was it 2018 at that conference? Yeah. 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 yeah, so you were speaking at a, a psychedelic conference uh, in Switzerland and I was just there as a, um, as, a, as a participant and uh, yeah like I said I was, I was it was a very fleeting moment when we met but I, I think for me it was actually a very strange moment because a, a few moments before that I'd actually just gone and had my first experience with with uh, with the 5 meo DMT because uh, so I was very sort of still coming around out of that and then just got to go around and meet people um, but after after we sort of we had that meeting and seen you on the panel there at that conference I watched your first documentary, um, which is so the, uh, the Underground Secret, and I thought it was absolutely superb. And I really, you know, I will strongly recommend to to anybody who's watching this if you have any kind of interest at all in, I would say, in psychedelics or consciousness, or particularly if you're interested in five meo DMT or Bufo, then check out the Underground Secret. It's a really, really good uh, documentary. It kind of, I would say, with, with that one, it's really a about kind of following a group through a kind of a, a story reel, isn't it? I mean, I, I suppose I don't want to, in your own words, how, how would you describe your two uh, pieces of film? Well, the first one, I, I can tell you the journey of the movie because... Please. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, when, I, when I first met Octavio and, and I tried it out, uh, I was truly shocked because, you know, I, I finally... I uh, met something I was looking for my whole life. 
I study mysticism, yoga, and all that stuff. And I was reading about the non-duality and samadhi and all that stuff. And suddenly I took a puff from a pipe and in 10 seconds I was there. Yeah, there you and, go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, how come? How is this possible? Mm -hmm. How is it possible that nobody knows about this powerful stuff? And even more, this stuff is legal in, in most countries because yep. it's so unknown. So I decided it would be worth to shoot a, shoot a short reportage about this. So we were planning to go to Colombia to shoot a movie about ayahuasca. So I decided to to take Octavio with us and we could shoot two movies at the same time. Okay. And so we took a group of 15 psychonauts to, to Colombia. We shoot the ceremonies and the original intention was to simply make an interview with the people before the ceremony, after the ceremony and the ceremony itself. And this is what we wanted. The budget was really, really funny. It was it was low. Yeah. But when I when I came back, uh, I had like 50, 60 hours of footage and uh, I decided that we can do something more. So I decided to contact Mr. Stanislav Grof, who is my hero yeah hero and he happened to travel to Czech Republic in a few weeks so we decided to make an interview with him and simply we made a full feature documentary and it was presented at the International Transpersonal Conference in Prague which we um, were helping to organize as well and this was the world premiere screening and after that uh, Many people were excited, but also many people came to us and said, hey, you should also mention some contraindications, some dangers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't want to create a scientific movie. We wanted to make an experiential movie. We were yeah. focused on the experience itself, what it means for us, for humanity, how it can transform our, our, our world. So after that, uh, I contacted... Uh, Michal Lanchura, who is an expert on integration, on psychedelics. And uh, also, <laughs> the funny thing was that the movie, at the premiere, it was seen by Pavel Bam, who is a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy in, in Geneva. And he saw the movie, and <laughs> he tried to go for the, work the very next day. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he's a politician, he's, he's working in the Global Drug Commission uh, with Kofi Annan and guys like this, Richard Branson. And he was uh, open to talk about his ex ex experience on camera, so I decided to shoot him as well. So we um, added another chapter, which was called The Future. Mm -hmm. And we edited the movie, and the final release was done in um, uh, January 2018. And then that, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think in terms of how what you say that it's this it's this kind of journey. That's as the as a viewer, that's how I really sort of interpret it. I, I saw the first film as yeah, very much like a, an experience. You know, it starts off with people literally traveling into sort of Colombia going through this thing and then what they sort of how they start to reconcile this all afterwards and then the second movie um i thought was such an interesting counterpoint to that first movie because this was much more um a, a lot more kind of like fact and sort of uh it was much more of a sort of a, almost like a guidebook really of um you know how to do this and sort of the ups and the downs and this it so it's it, it really felt like watching the two kind of back to back is that there was a like a a learning curve going through this and, th and th that's something i kind of wanted to to talk to you about a little actually because i suppose one of the interesting things about 5meo or bufo is that unlike something like sort of like ayahuasca when you think of ayahuasca there's always this kind of like all this kind of cultural stuff that comes with it going back thousands of years and stuff and people always say oh yeah ayahuasca is it's made you know it's, it's so traditional and stuff whereas the the five meo stuff and, and buffo is is very very new there's not this as much of a traditional kind of framework around it and i think we're kind of we're almost assembling these traditions in kind of real time around it and that's and i think in particular it ties into you know with some of the speakers that you had on uh, on, on on both things where it's you know you had i think a, a mailing is it you pronounce it the um on, on the second movie she's coming from a very sort of like more clinical research sort of background and then contrasting with someone like Octavio who's, who's 
kind of coming at it from this kind of sh- shamanic angle. I, I know he's, I don't think he necessarily uses the term shaman, but it's certainly got this kind of traditional vibe to it. But yet, we'll ad- openly admit that it's like it, it, you know, it's, this is the, it, something he's inventing for it. So, how do you how do you, how do you sort of per- perceive that this kind of collision between something which, on the one hand, feels I don't know, very old and, and sacred or something, but it's actually, you know, on the other hand, he's kind of very new and it's just, is happening in real time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why we made the second movie, because we created an interest in the, in the compound, in the, in the Buffalo Valley ceremonies, and, but we didn't film everything, you know, it, mm-hmm. the movie would have to be four hours long in order to fit everything into one movie. And also the issues about Octavio and about different facilitators made us think about it. We also gained some new information, gained some new info about the research. And we decided to that our message is finally complete when we shot the second movie because it's really it's really tricky. It's it's not ayahuasca like you said, it's not mushrooms, it's not LSD, it's completely different it is still something new and we need to build some kind of safe container for the ceremonies these days yeah and that's why we decided to to make the second movie i think it's really important and i guess that everyone who ever wants to try goof or should should watch the movie mm-hmm. and some people will decide that they don't want to and that's perfectly okay i think and some will be excited and they will go for it. But I think that if anybody wants to try Bufo, he or she should get as much information as possible. Because uh, absolutely, it is, yeah. It is, it is new. And uh, from my perspective, the real ceremony starts after the ceremony. Mm-hmm. You know, because <laughs> the ceremony itself takes just uh, 15 minutes or 10 minutes. But then you come back to this world. Sometimes your worldview can be totally shifted or destroyed and you are like born again and you live how to live with this new knowledge in, in your life and so it's it's not easy and certainly this compound is not for everybody. Definitely. In the beginning we thought it, it is because we shot the movie with very experienced people, psychonauts in Colombia, also we were in a great environment for integration. We were in the care of local shamans, you know, so everybody was okay. Every experience in my first movie is is okay. I didn't delete any bad or, you know, bad experience. Mm-hmm. Everybody had a nice experience. But over the time, I saw that like maybe like 10% of the people, they have really tough integrations yep. that can take like sometimes a few months, sometimes even one or two two years. And one percent of the people, they really need some some help from some from some experts how to integrate the the experience. So I think it's really important that we made the second movie and that we talk about this very important subject. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it really does pull the rug out from under you. Like I don't think anything else quite does, especially in the sort of in the in the high doses. And I think that was an interesting point in the second movie where. Um, there was a, a part where the conversation was around synthetic 5-MeO oh. versus Bufo. And the, the, obviously the major difference there is that you can really dial in the, the, the synthetic stuff because you can be very precise with how much you're, you're sort of getting. And you know, once you've, you know, your, you know your limit or your dosage, then you can pretty much sort of keep it there. Whereas the Bufo element is, is so variable because like who knows what was going on with the toad at that time, at that moment that you got the resin out of it. So I think that's, a, I thought it was a, a very, because I, I was certainly up until that point of, of watching uh, the second film, I was kind of in that kind of a plant medicine mentality where I was like, Bufo is best because that's that's the, the kind of the natural one. And then after watching that, I was like, oh, right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that it, it would, you know, first of all, why, you know, Go through all this, all this thing with these toads because there, there is some topics there. But perhaps these, you know, these toads are now becoming endangered because people are, are abusing it. So it's kind of a, a different topic. But then, if if the synthetic is is just as good and is getting the experience just as, you know, in, in just as potent away, then 
well, why not? What, what's, you know, let's leave the toads to it. So I thought that was a, a, a really sort of, you know, a, a interesting bit of information that made me think. But uh, just to sort of, just to come back to the sort of kind of point there, and I mean, let's kind of deal with the, um, the you know, the gorilla in the corner of the room, which is sort of the stuff around Octavio, because this was, he is, I mean, for anyone who's, who's watched my channel for a while, then you, you might have seen I've done some videos on Octavio, and I'll just, just to give a little bit of background for those who, who aren't aware of that. Uh, Octavio Rettig is a, uh, for want of a better, a, a kind of a facilitator, uh, you know, shaman, for want of a better term. Again, he, he himself, I don't think, would use the term shaman, but who facilitates uh, bufo ceremonies. And I went through uh, this ceremony, like I was just talking about earlier, and he, he was, I, I really liked the guy. I, I, he was very gentle and very sort of patient with me, and he sort of he guided me through the ceremony very well, and I was very sort of grateful to him and I was aware at the time from the panel that, that you did actually later on in the e that evening he started alluding to some controversial elements and I kind of laughed it off at the time because uh, you know I, I just didn't, didn't kind of know better I was still you know it, it just didn't, didn't seem it seemed a bit kind of weird but then afterwards after I, I, I started talking about my experience with Octavia then people would start sending me video footage of, of him doing other things and I found it very shocking um, that this guy who had kind of, you, you can't really go through a ceremony with somebody like that and not get some kind of attachment to them. And then mm. when you when you sort of see them acting in a way where, which seemed, you know, for want of a better term, sort of unethical or like it was, it was being, putting people in danger. Um, I, I really didn't know what to do with it. I was kind of like, oh sh shit, how do I feel about this now? And so in the end, I kind of, I, I, I made a sort of statement saying, I, I don't agree with these statements. I think this is kind of, this is dangerous. But I think, I, I think what you're alluding to earlier is that you, as you were coming out with your documentary, you're, you're also in the middle of, of this kind of information coming to light. So what was that like for you? You know, you've, I, I guess, you know, you, you've just, you've created this, this piece of, you know, documentary, which is superb documentary, heavily featuring this 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 guy who again comes across super well in in the documentary and you know again he's, he's on uh, you know for most times of the day he's a super nice guy but then all, all this this kind of stuff starts coming to light that something's not quite right what was how did that play out um, well <clears throat> to be honest i was i was very angry and i was very upset by the by the information I received about about him you know uh, like like you when I first met him I really liked him as a guy he 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 simply delivered one of the best experiences I had in my life when I smoked the buffalo with him so I'm still very grateful to him mm -hmm. but over the time I got some reports and messages from people saying and sending me videos as, as well as you and may, maybe you can see it in the in the conference when I sit there next to Octavio and Dennis McKenna that when he was, you know, talking about his ceremonies and why he's how why he's doing the stuff like he's doing, it, you could see that my face was pretty upset already yeah. at the time because I knew he was working in a dangerous way. Everybody was talking to him, telling him to change the way how he works, but he simply didn't listen. He, you know. <laughs> He did it in the way he did, and unfortunately, one girl died in Mexico, and that was that was the point of no return. Mm. And unfortunately, this was the time when we started to work on worldwide distribution of the movie. I made deal with iTunes, with uh, Amazon, YouTube, Gaia, and all these <clears throat> medias, and. I was I was sending press releases about about the movie and wanted to spread the info about the movie, but at the time nobody wanted to support any movie which featured Octavio, so he really <clears throat> made made it impossible for the movie to be known. Yeah. It's very well known in 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 Central Europe, in Czech Republic. Uh, we made so many screenings in cinemas, but getting it out out to to the world was pretty tough for us and I was really upset about it because he destroyed many months, hard months of my of my of my work. 
But on the other hand, uh, I must say that I I agree with most of the things that he's saying in the movie. Yeah. I think that his his speech in the movie is really really beautiful. Uh, I don't agree with giving the medicine to the breastfeeding or pregnant women. I also don't agree with his final statement that everybody should try this and that the only obstacle is the fear. I completely disagree with this. But the rest of the things he's saying in the movie I, I really, really like. It's uh, it's really sad situation. Well, I think, I think it's a testament to, to, your, to your filmmaking there because yeah. at the time when I saw it, I, you know, I, I was, I, I'd all, I'd, kind of was at the point in my journey where it's like, I was like, I was thinking that Octavia was kind of lost the plot. And I was, I was expecting when I, when I watched the film that I was going to be thinking kind of like watching it negatively. But as you say, he, the, I think the message for the most part that he's putting out there is, is, is positive, is, you know, it, it fits the context of the movie and the overall movie uh, documentary itself isn't about Octavio. It's about the sort of the medicine and, and, the, and the group. And so I think, you know, I think that's the thing I would want to put out there to, to anyone who's who wants to to watch a sort of a, a movie about psychonauts or about 5MEO, but it's maybe hesitant because of, of that connection. I think you, you can, you, you can what it, it does stand on its own, I think. I think it's, uh, and I certainly found myself that as I was uh, sort of watching it, I was, I, I Again, I, I, the thing I probably th- came to at the end was like, wh- why, why does he have to do this then? Because he, he seems it's what he puts across in that movie. So, yeah, it's like it's what you kind of get expect from any kind of facilitator or or shaman. He, he seems very sort of together. So, the the other stuff with the kind of like you know the the water and the electric zapping stuff just seems so unnecessary. I suppose like one question: was, Did you have any kind of insight into into what his what his thinking is around these kind of extreme practices that he does well <clears throat> when we first met i really didn't know any anything about this if, if i knew uh he probably wouldn't be in, in the movie or we would confront him and ask him about about his his techniques and why he's using them i i'm really sorry but we simply didn't know yeah uh, uh, it was really hard to find someone who was who would be open to, sp- to speak openly in, into the camera about UFO because I know many really good facilitators in, for example, in Canada or in the United States, or but they, you know, they don't want to go public with this because they work in in US or in Canada where it is illegal. So it was pretty tough to find someone, and at the same time, I wanted to feature in the movie a guy who is at the time he was the most known person to work with Buffo alongside with Dr. Jerry mm-hmm. but, <laughs> but at the time Dr. Jerry already showed signs of, of bad practice so we didn't want to include him yeah and Octavio is such a character as well so I mean he, 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 he is he does have a certain presence to him just to sort yeah. of just to fill in for the for the audience so I would I'd say at the time that uh, Philip's talking around, the, the, there's kind of two big names around uh, around Buffor were Octavio on the one hand and Jerry Sandeville, I think he's called, on, on the other hand. And so these were the kind of, you know, the feature, if anybody was ever making a documentary about Buffor, it would be one of these two that would go, I think like Vice was making documentaries around Jerry Sandeville and stuff like that. And it kind of, it, it just so happened that both of them were kind of problematic in slightly different ways. And it all really kind of exploded at the same time. And, and the two even got sort of t- tied together through this kind of open letter that got got published. Which, And I think the, the real sort of tragedy there, I mean, apart from, like you mentioned, Philip, that it impacted your work and sort of caused this big sort of, you know, pushback against this great film that you'd made, was that it also kind of then hangs over the whole kind of buffo yeah. thing. And, and it's... I, uh, I think that's why the you know the, the second film I think you made is, is so important because I think that w- what it really did for me for, anyway in that second film was to uh, it, it seemed like you'd, you'd made that specifically to address a lot of these sort of these topics and that was really good because those things needed addressing. Um, so yeah, perhaps we could sort of like move on a, a bit to 
that sort of how how you got to, to the to the, the the second film was it really as a sort of a direct sort of um, answer to the, the controversy around sort of Octavio and, and, and Buffo in the first film? Yes, that was for sure part of it. But at the same time, we wanted to share some some new information that we had over over the years after making the first movie. And but yes, uh, the controversies about, around the facilitators were one reason. And for me, one of the important reasons is also the synthetic version of Fagnio DMT. Mm-hmm. Because I really think, you know, I've been at the World Buffalo Virus Conference in Mexico in 2018. And I have met many, many locals who live in, in Sonora, the, from the Yaqui tribes or from the different tribes in Sonora. And they told me that the thing, the thing is really, really massive there. Yeah. There are so many, yeah, there are so many different collectors, you know, the price of the medicine went really high because of the demand. So even the narcos are interested in, in the medicine, you know, and they go there with pickups, they pick up the toads and they, they simply kill them, you know, and this is really endangering the, the species. And from what, what I know now, the 5 meal DMT, the synthetic version, is, is much safer, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's cheaper, it's ecological, and it's ethical. You know, with the buffalo virus venom, you still don't know how much of the buffalo is actually in there, and uh, it's, it's not very safe because the photonin and other compounds in the, in the venom, they, they can affect your cardiovascular system, your, your heart, and if you have some problems with your cardiovascular system, with your heart, with high blood pressure, you can get into trouble during the ceremony. Yeah. And it's really dangerous and unfortunately some, some people have died, you know, after, after smoking the, the buffo. And so that was another reason. Well, I think that, that's I think that's one of the reasons why you know what what sort of Octavio doing was so startling because it, you are in this kind of vulnerable position when you you know when you when you have a buffo and it does come up with these risks. So then to add further risks on top of that, you know, you would mm-hmm. often do something with uh, pouring water yeah. in, you know in, into people's mouths and noses or. Um, using sort of high amounts of, of sort of rapé, which is a, a kind of a nicotine sort of snuff, it just it seems sort of very sort of unnecessary. Um, just just an unnecessary level of risk on top of another risk. And and another thing which which I kind of experienced from my own time in sort of South America, um, doing things like ayahuasca retreats, was that bufo was always seemed to be it was treated like an add-on. Like it was like if you went for an, like an ayahuasca treat, it's like and you can, you know, tack, pay an extra little bit and we'll we'll fit in a buffo ceremony there. And I thought this was just this was just insane because you sort of you're sandwiching it in to you know say like a seven day medicine retreat where you probably already had like you know a couple of ayahuasca ceremonies and you may you know have the interactions going on there from sort of the ayahuasca MAOIs. And just as as you, you, you talked about at the beginning, a buffo is such a significant medicine that just to treat it as something that you can just sandwich in between a few other things i think is it's great it needs its own space um it's not like a it's not an add-on at all it's like the main event <laughs> so so yeah I, I i think it's i think there's some kind of ideas that need to change there um but i think and the other one thing i meant what you mentioned regarding uh the sort of the, the difference with the buffo and the synthetic is that the, the synthetics also is just easier to do because the the, the buffo requires higher volumes of the, of the actual stuff because the amount of five mo in it is is I think it's about like fifteen twenty percent sort of thing is it um, so you're doing you're actually smoking quite a lot of the toad venom to get the five mo and I remember when I was doing it I was I was like I cannot take any more of this smoke it was i was just so full uh of, of the smoke was with the five meo you can say just dial it into a very um uh precise amount so it's so yeah i would think that's probably the probably the the future of it and you do go into quite a bit of of the, of the sort of in particularly in the second film where you're talking around 
what's kind of gonna gonna happen here within this kind of psychedelic renaissance do, do, do you have any sort of particular thoughts on you know i, I suppose you know your experience with that retreat in Colombia, which was did, did have a kind of a traditional vibe to it versus you know what sort of Malin was was talking about uh is it, is it Malin or Marlin sorry the the, the Marlin, Marlin. Marlin, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not from Norway. I don't know. <laughs> Marlin. <laughs> yeah. Well, but she was kind of referring more to the, the kind of the possibilities of a uh, like a clinical kind of setting and sort of do you know, Have you experienced both those things? And do you think which do you have like a kind of a preference there? Uh, no, I haven't. I have never experienced any clinical setting. But uh, but I'm but I'm completely okay with it. You know, if we want to legalize psychedelics later, first we need to do clinical tri- trials. We mm-hmm. we need to change the perception of the psychedelics in the eyes of the general public, and this is this is usually done through science. You know, these days. So so I'm perfectly okay with this. But I hope that in the future we will be able to do legal ceremonies with intelligence in uh, without any clinical setting because I have seen some some rooms that, that, that were set up for the experience and to be honest I, I would never want to have any experience in, in, in these places you know yeah it looks, like, it looks like in a hospital and it's okay for the research but if you go there for treatment or for therapy or to have your biggest experience of your life I don't think the setting setting is, is okay for this yeah, you'd feel but like a sick it, person, like you're sort of, you were there yeah. for a, yeah. But, but you have to start somehow, mm-hmm. and if you start like this, I'm perfectly okay with it, but do it. Yeah, I think there's also an element that we've, I, I think, that, you know, the, the clinical aspect is, is one extreme, and if we think, you know, sort of going to South America is, is the other extreme, and we're talking about a kind of psychedelic renaissance or a psychedelic explosion of, of these sort of medicines into the modern world. So somewhere in there, we, we have got to find our own, for want of a better term, tradition. Um, tradition is not the right term at all, but we, we've got you know a way of kind of having our own sort of rituals around these things. So, so oh, because not not everyone can certainly you know do that sort of trip to South America, or not everyone's comfortable kind of like importing you know a, a, a sort of a foreign culture's tradition because it doesn't necessarily mean anything to them. But yet here we are in you know in, in a sort of in, in the Western world and we've got very little sort of in terms of our own ritual for these psychedelic medicines and our, our own kind of you know spiritual practices are very kind of you know archaic and tied up in religion and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I think that'll be interesting to to see what we do there if we if we just invent something some kind of new. I don't know, psychedelic religion or psychedelic um, ritual around these things. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I, I quite like, I, I do still find a lot of um, use and comfort in the traditional setting. Um, I just I just find there's something like very, very beautiful, particularly with something like, say, like ayahuasca, where you go, you know, when you're in that traditional setting, you're in the jungle, and you you know you can hear all the all the frogs chirping and you, the fireflies. Wasn't it? There's something just insanely beautiful about that. But yeah, we definitely need a way to uh, to get this out into the mainstream. Did, did just coming back to something you said at the beginning, you mentioned that you made two films back to back. So did you also do the ayahuasca documentary though? Or oh no, no, no. It's it's still not finished, and actually. I decided to to make the movie a little bit different because there is a lot of movie about about ayahuasca. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I decided uh, to the working title is a history of the future, you know. And <laughs> and this title came to me when I had one ayahuasca session because uh, you know one year ago I was uh, designing a robot. I, I did a design for for the agricultural robot. Mm-hmm. which uses artificial intelligence and everything, you know. And I had the ayahuasca session, I was thinking about the design and it came to me. But then I realized that, you know, I'm now designing a robot. And when I was a kid, I was reading books about about robots about, in science fiction, about mm-hmm. artificial intelligence. And now it's real. Mm-hmm. Now, 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 it's, now it's here. And so I realized that science fiction actually 
is writing the history of the future in a, in a way. Because when we think about the future, we are creating it. But I think that these days we, we like some real vision for the future. You know, the Western society seems to have no vision where to go, what to do. And I think we should work on it. We should make a vision of our future, how, what we want to live, what we want to happen in the future. And when we have this vision, we can work on it. And so that's why I changed the title like this. And I have interviewed uh, Stan Groff again. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed Dennis McKenna and uh, Amit Goswami, the quantum physicist. And I would also like to interview Graham Hancock and Rupert Sheldrake. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, but these days it's, it's hard because of the COVID and all the situation. And I think that the movie should be, or could be about how we could inspire ourselves from the past, what we can learn from the ayahuasca, from the traditional indigenous nations and how we can shape our future according to, to this forgotten knowledge. I think that this is something what we, what we need. Yeah. So, and so, so this is your, ne your next project. Is, it, is, this, is this going to be the next film that comes out then? I hope so. I hope so. But, you know, it's pretty hard to get, get money for, for movie, movies like this. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I get them, I'm working on it. We'll see. And I have also in mind a third movie, which uh, I could do together with my good friend, uh, Scott Awesome. He's a professor at, at Florida at Ocala University. And he's a world expert on the <clears throat> golden section, you know, uh, the fee, fee, number fee. And he has written several books about it. And uh, it's simply a fascinating subject. You know, the number fee, is, it's everywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. And... It's in art, it's in, in planets, it's in atoms, it's in, in spirals of the galaxy. And this movie could be more mainstream, but at the same time it could show that something strange is going on when this this number is, is everywhere, you know. And Scott is a very, very interesting person. We met at the Buffalo Virus Conference in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Talk and talked for many hours, then he made screening for our movie in Florida and Miami and we talked for hours and we decided to make make this movie and it, it could be also also interesting and Scott is a really nice person he's a world expert on mysticism on mathematics philosophy and all that stuff and he smokes a lot of buffo and uh, drinks ayahuasca you know and he's I don't know how old is he, maybe he's like 70 years old, but he's still doing these things and wow. he gets inspiration from, from plants and from, from Ufo. He's a great guy and this movie could be interesting as well. I, bet, I always thought that would be like a fascinating kind of area to study with, 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 if, with that math, you know, the mathematical area, because when, you, when you're in one of these experiences, I mean, it, it's the thing that kind of pops out to everyone. You start seeing all these kind of geometry and they're kind of like the numbers sort of sequences that you mentioned. It, it's all there so i mean it doesn't matter kind of what your your personal sort of explanation is for you know whether this whether these psychedelics are sort of triggering something internal to ourselves or whether it's opening up some kind of portal to somewhere else or whatever your thoughts on consciousness is the fact is that this stuff is is there within our conscious experience and th there is a symmetry to it and a geometry to it and these this kind of mathematical constants to it and it just seems so kind of at odds with the, the, the squishy biology, which is, you know, we, we kind of have taught to us at school that all we are is this kind of, you know, this piece of meat brain and there's just electrical impulses going around. But then you just flick a few little chemical switches and these incredibly complex and structural objects, which just seem to have some kind of universal truth appear. That, uh, yeah, I always thought that if, if you're a mathematician, you it would be... Um, something you could you could really sort of de delve deeper into that topic so i'd love to yeah if, if, if you do make that movie i'd love to see it i think that'd be a great topic i think you know i'm not a materialist i believe that consciousness is all that all that is mm -hmm. and i believe that geometry and mathematics are the tools how to build this this reality 
Um, that's why the, <laughs> the physics is all based on, on, on mathematics, you know, and <laughs> that's why mathematics can explain everything, because this is how the consciousness created this, this reality. So it's, it's obvious that when you go to a deeper state of consciousness, you meet these beautiful geometries and fractals and Fibonacci numbers and golden sections, because this is the base of our reality, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm never sure. I, I keep flipping between sort of different uh, kind of theories around it, which which I gravitate towards. And I think at the moment, I've just kind of got, I've gotten to the point where it's like, it's, it's just whatever it is, it's awesome. So I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's just, it's just, it's kind of amazing, and it's just, it's almost, I, I almost kind of feel like it's just. It's something to be experienced rather than something to be understood because I think it's possibly just beyond comprehension. Um, and, I, I, and I find a kind of a, a comfort in that. I think it allows me to sort of release and let go from a lot of my kind of control freaky need to know everything because you just, it's, yeah, you can't. It's just, you're, you're, a, you're a pixel amongst like, you know, the IMAX cinema of, of the universe. So it's... Yeah, yeah this, you just got to you just got to bask in the awe of it. This happened to me after my first Bufo experience because you know I, I read a lot of books. I'm interested in in science, mathematics, philosophy, everything. I try to gain as much information as possible and make sense of this reality. And after my Bufo experience, I, I realized that this is impossible. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the universe is simply infinite, and there is even infinite number of other universes and no way a uh, human mind can, can comprehend and contain everything that is that is out there. But I realized that you don't have to understand everything. You can simply you can simply be. <laughs> you can simply yeah. be, enjoy your life and try to be a good good person and that's it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. This this is the kind of the message that I try and promote on my channel is just, yeah, just be a good human being. Just get the best out of this experience because no matter what you believe, if, if, if you believe that, you know, this is just a transient phase into some kind of, you know, infinite multiverse, then that's going to happen anyway. And if you believe in the kind of the religious aspect of, you know, that there's going to be an afterlife, well, that's going to happen anyway. And, you know, perhaps if you believe in the hardcore sort of scientific thing of that, you know, the lights just go off and you're, you're, that's annihilation. Well, that's it. The only thing we kind of know is we are having this experience right now. So make it the best experience that you can be for you and for sort of, you know, and the people that you, you care about and, and, for, and, you know, for the, the, the planet in your immediate environment. Because the last thing you, I think any of us want is that when it comes to our sort of time and we're at that moment of transition into whatever does come next, you don't want to be sat there full of regret and sort of, you know, feeling like you've wasted your time because, you know, you, you'd spent years deluding yourself that you were, you know, the Messiah or you'd spent sort of, you know, years just being angry or you'd spent sort of, you, you know, you just want to make sure that at the point where you go, just, okay, that I, I did the best I could with that experience. And uh, I, I, I say that as someone who's not, not quite faced their death yet. So, so we'll, see, we'll see how I stand up to it. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree, you know. And uh, it's funny that I know many people who had so many different ayahuasca sessions. They had many bufo and, and they think that they are something better. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is how do you behave. Yeah. If you are a good person, if you if you simply con contribute some good to to the world, then that's all that matters. And it doesn't matter if you had ayahuasca or you, or you hadn't. You know. So I, yeah. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If you don't make, if, going to church does not make you spiritual. Drinking ayahuasca does not gonna, is not going to necessarily fix your life. Only it's the actions that we take. I think this is the kind of the important thing. So what I'd, what I'd like to do, Philip, is just do, I'll just scan through um, the audience. Uh, there's been a sort of a chat feed going on as I've been talking. And um, well, let's see what the audience says. So from Theodore, um, he was asking if you knew what the legality was of of psychedelics or 5-MeO in the Czech Republic. Do you have sort of any insight there? It is still legal. It is still legal here in Czech Republic. It's not scheduled. 
And as far as I know, it's legal in, in most countries in, in the world because the substance is very unknown. Mm -hmm. If I get it right, it was scheduled in the United States in 2013, I, I guess. And it was still legal back then. Uh, so uh, I recommend uh, Ralph Metzner's book, The Toad and Jaguar. Mm -hmm. he, he worked at the 5 Neo DMT for 30 years because it was legal and he made an underground research of the 5 Neo DMT. And he decided to publish the book after it was scheduled in the United States. So in the United States it's, it's illegal. But in many countries, it's it's completely legal. In, for example, in Europe or in South South uh, America and Middle America. Yeah, it's it's, it's very. I, I think most of the places where I've been in Europe, it's yeah, it's. I don't want to say it's commonly available because it's not something you can just pop down the street and buy. But if you sort of look online, you you don't have to. It's not you don't necessarily have to go through the dark net or anything like that to to get to. So it's it's kind of available in what, I guess what you call like a research camp kind of thing. And it's funny, you know, the strongest psychedelics we know. And <laughs> <laughs> it's legal. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's absolutely. It, it's, it's crazy. But yeah, when when it, when it, when I saw it on like that, that you could just buy it. It was like, really? Is this really it? But yeah, it was it's completely it. Um, the one someone is asking. Let's see. Uh, Athlon two forty is asking. Which I think we've probably answered anyway. But I'll just just to clarify on it. Uh, on the uh, Bufo population, would you advocate then for non-nature intensive interaction? So I guess is, the, the question is um, synthetic versus uh, the kind of the Bufo. Which, which way do you lean now? Yeah, these days uh, I'm for synthetic version. Yeah. It's safer, ecological, ethical, cheaper. It's easier to, to make the right dose. And the toads are really threatened these days. And the de demand is going up. And it, it's not good for them. They are already threatened by ecological problems, yeah. by you know, by uh, various chemicals put into the water, into the soil, and collectors as well, and the narcos and everything. And I believe we should completely switch to five meal DMT. And uh, I recommend watching uh, latest Hamilton's Pharmacopeia. Yeah, yeah, I've just I've seen yeah. it. Don't, don't worry, it, it, does, it goes yeah. to the lab, doesn't it, and sort of synthesizes okay. it. And, you know, if you synthesize <laughs> 10 kilos, it's enough for the whole world for several years, you know. Yeah. Because the dose is just 5 milligrams, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the low dose, the medium yeah. is like 10 and the big is 20. So one gram is, is really enough for a lot of people. You know? Yeah. And I think another thing as well, which comes back, we were talking earlier about uh, Jerry Sandoval, because I think one of, one of Jerry Sandoval's kind of big you know, grifts was um, he would be constantly sort of fleecing money to, to raise money for these kind of toad sanctuaries for you know to, to preserve the toad. And if we make the switch completely to 5-MEO, then we can basically just kind of eliminate the need for that market at all, and which will just then, like I say, leave the toads in peace. And so and it kind of, it gets rid of the kind of the, the opportunities for grifters, I think, like Jerry Sandoval, to, to you know, kind of milk the emotional aspect and sort of get people to sort of give him money. Because I, I know, uh, you know, I had a conversation with a guy who really got shafted by uh, by Jerry Sanderville. So I think, yeah, if we could sort of close down that aspect of the market, it would be a good thing. Yeah, the problem is that all the facilitators in Mexico will tell you that the bufo is the, is the thing. Yeah. This is the best and synthetic doesn't work. But it's simply not true. They are just trying to protect their unique business, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it, it, it tags like like I mentioned with myself. That there is this kind of mystique around the whole kind of you know plant medicine nature thing, and I think in this in this particular case, it's one that we should yeah we should just demystify the kind of the bullshit around it because um, I, I think the, I, I, after watching your second documentary, I was kind of completely changed my uh, my position on that. Um, one thing, so Andrew Dunton asked a similar question, saying, "How do you feel about Vice, uh, about Hamilton promoting the use of synthetic 5-MeO DMT only, and how does it affect the user's experience?" And I think I think Marlin covers this pretty well. So, so I mean, I got, I'll just do a quick plug for you, here, Philip. Uh, guys, what I say to everybody who's watching, go and check out um, 
Phillips documentary because his second documentary is on YouTube for, for free, I believe. That just, so that's where I saw it. So I hope it was the official <laughs> the official one. Um, but yeah, so if you check, look for Bufo Alvarius Reloaded, this is Phillips' second film. Go and check that out. It's amazing. It answers really goes into a lot of detail on all these things. And I guess what, what you'd probably say there, Philip, is that, um, yeah, you would sort of, the kind of the use of a synthetic 5 meo dmt is the, is the same user experience that's what what's been found is there's no real difference many many people actually say that the experience of the synthetic version is better because it, it goes straight to the point where you where you want to go mm -hmm. because there are always different chemicals in the in the buffer secretion it's very critical to use the right temperature lighter mm -hmm. so you destroy all the toxins which, which are there. There is over 20 different compounds in the, in the venom, and you are interested in just one. And and there are 19 others, and we simply don't know what they do pharmacologically. And Melin also made an interesting point. It is much easier to legalize a compound that is clear, yeah. including just one molecule. You can never legalize a venom. You know, a venom that contains 20 different molecules in unknown amount. So I yeah. believe the future is synthetic. Yeah, yeah and, and even just even in the description there, we you know you say venom, and there's there's such a connotation around that world around that word. It doesn't sound like something good. So yeah, I, I would I would completely agree. Um, Miguel Gonzalez asks, what do you think, this is a completely a sidestep question, but I think it's a good one. What do you think of the monolith sequence in 2001 A Space Odyssey? Oh, well, I, I love it. This is one of my <laughs> favorite movies. <laughs> I can show you my t-shirt. This is, this is <laughs> well, perfect. <laughs> a true filmmaker's t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I love it. And it's a, Perfect movie, and who knows? Maybe it really happened, so, or maybe this is just a metaphor for psychedelics. It's yeah, I mean, it, it, it's. I mean, it's definitely true. I think that the, the whole things of, of this kind of metaphor of this kind of this journey. I think you know our our human journey taken to the extreme. I think you know, and I, I that's that's why how I sort of interpret two thousand and one. Obviously, you've got the very early ancestral stuff. The bits where they go into the kind of the moon station is the kind of the ordinary bit, and then obviously the you know the extremes of our sort of as as we transcend into into something new. I, just, I think it's, yeah, I absolutely love that film. I think it's it's just completely timeless. The point of a filmmaker, uh, I still don't understand how he how he pulled it off. Because yeah, it's it insane really for, for the time. Such a special effects in the sixties. Yeah, but it's simply amazing. Yeah, he was yeah. a yeah, it holds up so. I mean, I watched it again. I think it was a couple of years ago, and it's yeah, it's the effects in it are kind of are kind of seems. There's no part where you, it looks sort of janky or anything. It's still it's su such a well made film. Um, to do it. So cultivating connections. As uh, what is the second documentary? I can't seem to find it. Uh, so it's called. I'm a correct Philip. It's called it's called Buford Alvarez Reloaded, the second documentary, yes. and it's available on YouTube. So. Or simply tell people to go to bufoalvarez.com. Mm -hmm. This is this is our website. This is where they go and watch the first movie, and there is a link to the to the second movie when they go to the to the news. Yeah. So bufoalvarez.com. Yeah, I'll put a link in the description below after after we after we get on this. So there'll, there'll be a link at, uh, down there to uh, to the website. I just wanted to actually. Uh, just just to mention uh, around the, the the two movies because not only did you sort of uh, you know film and assemble the movies but am I right in thinking you you did all the the three D graphics work that's in there as well? Yes, yes. Because yes. that's, that's awesome, mate. That is so some of the trippiest, most yeah, beautiful <laughs> things. Like it sometimes you're looking at it, it's like it kind of looks um, it looks like a kind of there's one where it's kind of Buddhist meditation, but then it turns into a frog and it's it's. Just really stunning animations, mate. So go, and I think some of those that's up there on the website. So go and check it out. Um, some questions here. Da, 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 da. Uh, uh, from Ryan, during ceremony, what type of music do you like being played? 
Uh, I like to sit with ayahuasca when someone plays a didgeridoo. So do you have, do you have any specific preferences yourself, or, or do you think this is like? Do you think it should be done well, in silence? Or? I've tried it several times, sometimes with just a shaker or with uh, Octavio singing some Icaros. But the biggest experience I ever had was when there was silence mm -hmm. and the facilitator started to play the Tibetan bowls. Oh, the yeah. Sound, yeah, the sound of, of these bowls. This is the only thing that can enhance the experience for, for me. Mm -hmm. So this is this is exactly the sound that illustrates the experience and that can take you even even deeper. Um, but then we, uh, you know, I also created the music for the movie together with my friends, and one of them is Mark. He's a great musician, and when he had this Bufo experience, he immediately sat at, at the keyboard and he created the music inspired by the experience and. This is this is we sometimes I've seen using these the, the track to during the ceremonies and and it's excellent. It's uh, I can send you a link as well. We can Please do, it. yeah. It's called Malk uh, Infinite Forgiveness. It's 24 minutes, and it perfectly illustrates the session with with Buffo Virus. Mm -hmm. So he, I think he made it. You know, <laughs> when you when you hear the music, I. I immediately go back to the experience, and when you play during the ceremony, it's amazing. Yeah. I really recommend this. But uh, other, other than that, uh, I haven't tried any any other music. But some meditative, meditative, very slow music is is okay. Yeah. But, you know, when you go to the full breakthrough, you you don't hear any music anymore. So. <laughs> how do you how, how do you think? That fact, just with with you being a musician and what you were saying earlier about the kind of like you know the math of the universe, um, it, do you sort of like perceive music in that same term? Because you know, like when you, when you're having one of these experiences and you do hear something like like the kind of the Tibetan droning sort of balls that you mentioned, then it you do get this this fear. It, it you know the, the phrase get, that gets thrown around a lot in sort of psychedelic circles is you know the frequency the frequency of the universe and it all seems to you feel that there's some kind of harmony to everything and it's it, it's all happening and that the, the the singing ball is tuning into your sort of consciousness and it's all it's all happening so yeah does does your own sort of like musical background or your sort of influence does how did that sort of influence your own style and or did you, did you have your own experiences where it was like you were trying to recreate that kind of synesthesia. Yeah, you know, because uh, I have a synesthesia. I have it since I was a kid. And oh wow! Okay. I can actually see music in my normal state of mind, or I can see sound in general. So for me, music is also a visual experience. So I can see the the vibrations and the frequencies. And so when I create my music, uh, it's always affected by the vision that I have in my head. And so yeah, I believe. That everything basically what we see is frequency. Mm -hmm. The the subatomic particles are just vibrating according to st string theory. Everything just a vibrating string, and depending on how it vibrates, it, it becomes a different subatomic particle. The sound is vibration. The light is a vibration. The air is spinning and it creates a vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's it. That's all. The vibrations. <laughs> well, I yeah, I mean, we, I mean, if you kind of come at it from, you know, the, a very sort of, you know, extreme angle, then you know, everything is energy. You know, even even if you come at it believing that everything is 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 matter, matter is kind of energy. You know, in sort of solid form. So, I think, yeah, you know, I, I, the idea of of everything being some sort of frequency is, is not. Uh, particularly sort of unusual i think i think and it makes a lot of sense within that kind of context um let's see da, 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 da. So someone's saying yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of comments saying that uh comment complimenting you on the on the graphics uh used within the um, people saying that um bassy music helps with the trip and let's see See, there was one here I saw earlier. I think we'll make this the last one. Um, do you think that specific cultural context of a psychedelic journey can discourage people from taking their plunge? I guess I think what what, what Tito might, might 
saying those. Um, do you think that it's... Or let me kind of phrase a question a different way. When, when you came to having your kind of first experiences with with 5ME or, or with psychedelics, did you have a kind of a cultural context where you, were you kind of going at it from, say, like the traditional framework or were you were you kind of like blank slate and just didn't really know what to expect? Well, my first experience was like 25 years ago <laughs> when, I, when I was 18 years old. Uh, I read a lot of books by Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, or mm-hmm. Castaneda. So I was I was interested in this, but at the same time, you know, it, it was 90s, and uh, it was really hard to get some true information about psychedelics. And all I could see in, in the media that people go crazy, they jump out of the windows, and yeah. people get mad, and don't do it, simply just say no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I read all these books, uh, it, it was a different story, so I decided to try, and I'm happy to live in Czech Republic where we have really good mushrooms. So mushrooms was my first experience, and when the experience started, I was so you know it was so profound, so deep, so so beautiful, and my first words that came out of my mouth was everybody is lying to us, you know, because. Why? How come? Why is that? That something that shows you beautiful things, something that can heal you, something that can mm-hmm. inspire you, is is forbidden. It's illegal, you know. And I really like the way how Graham Hancock talks about this when he said that this is not a war on drugs. This is actually a war on consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, the elites are happy if if the psychedelics are illegal because it suits their their needs and. This is the real reason why why they are banned. This is a political reason. Nobody's trying to protect our mental health. You know, it's quite the opposite, I guess. So, yeah, I was I was in a state of shock, and since that time, I'm a big fan of psychedelics, and uh, I don't trust authorities anymore. You know, because they lie to us about it. Luckily, it's changing these days because of the Renaissance and the new research. So I'm very mm-hmm. grateful for that. But still, the general public have no idea, and they think that heroin and cocaine is the same as LSD or MDMA. And yeah, that's insane. That's yeah. just what also I wanted to show in my movie and that psychedelics are something completely different. Yeah, they are tools that can help us heal ourselves. They can heal people with depression, with trauma, with PTSD. Or they can help you to live a better life. Of course, you have to use them in the right way. You have to use. You have to be careful about contraindications. You have to have good set and setting. And if you do, then the experience can be beneficial for you. you know, sometimes it's the experience itself. It's not nice. You know, when I go to an ayahuasca ceremony, I'm always a little bit afraid. I I had many, but still I'm afraid because you never know what will happen, and it's so different and but when the morning comes, I'm always grateful that I made the decision to go. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I th- and I think that, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's all about using these things responsibly. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, I can certainly relate to, uh, to what you said about ayahuasca. You know, I, I, I go to an ayahuasca center expecting to get my ass kicked, you know, because I know I've got some issues to work on and, and I know it's, it's not going to be easy. And so that's kind of, you know, I, I, every time I go, I'm always absolutely crapping myself, thinking, "Oh my God, why did I do this?" But like you say, you you, you go through it, and in the morning, you're, you're you know, five percent maybe on your way to sort of resolving these things, and it, they're not, you know, it's not like an overnight quick fix. Uh, these are sort of very, you know, it can be very almost like you know an ordeal experience. And I think as as we talked about at the beginning. The actual thing is not even the thing. You know, anybody can drink ayahuasca. Anybody can can smoke a pipe with some bufo in it. That's not the the hard work. The hard work comes afterwards. Like you say, the ceremony comes after the ceremony. And if you don't put that sort of that work in there to to, to sort of integrate this and and to really make sense of it, if you just go straight back to your bad habits and straight back to, to you know your your toxic relationships and your you know your addictions and whatever, you're not going to get anywhere with it. But if you if you need, if you're prepared to make those changes and you're prepared to sort of to walk that path, then uh, yeah, I mean these things can be miraculous. I mean, I don't think there's, there's 
not many not many other words you can you can you can use for it so i mean phil i, th- I think that's a, a really good place to to wrap it up man i want to say i just Thank you so much for making the time and thank you so much just for, for making the time to make these documentaries. And again, anyone who's watching, go and check them out. Really great. I'll leave the link below uh, to, to Philip's website um, and also also to the, to the second documentary, which is on YouTube. Um, but yeah, man, I, I hope you continue making many more um, and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing what, what you come up with next. Okay, thank you for your kind words and... I wish you good luck and thank you for inviting me. It was really great. That's a pleasure, mate. And next time, if, you, if you're back in Switzerland, uh, yeah, hit me up and hopefully, with it, hopefully when yeah, once COVID has gone back to us like a normal situation, then we may, might have some more psychedelic, yeah. face-to-face psychedelic conferences and hopefully under ha- happier circumstances. So cheers, mate. And thanks to everyone uh, for watching. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. Bye.